No less than 200 youths were joined in wedlock during those tumultuous days. Some a month, others a few days, and still others, but a brief moment, were able to tarry undisturbed in the company of their brides. No one among them failed, as the beating of the drum announced the hour of his departure, to respond joyously to the call. Each and every one ungrudgingly offered himself as a sacrifice for his true beloved. All drank eventually the cup of martyrdom. No wonder the spot that has been the theatre of untold sufferings and has witnessed such heroism has been named Ardi Allah by the Bab, a title that has remained for all time linked with his own blessed name. And a footnote to Ardi Allah, the exalted spot, title given to Zanjan by the Bab. Among the companions was a certain Kabilai Abdul Baki, the father of seven sons, five of whom Hujat joined in wedlock. The nuptial ceremonies were hardly at an end when cries of terror suddenly announced the resumption of a fresh offensive against them. They sprang to their feet and, forsaking their loved ones, instantly rushed out to repulse the invader. All five fell in turn in the course of that encounter. The eldest of them, a youth greatly esteemed for his intelligence and of renowned courage, was captured and conducted into the presence of the Amir Tuman. Lay him upon the ground, cried the infuriated Amir, and kindle upon his breast, which dared nourish so great a love for Hujat, a fire that shall consume it. Wretched man, burst forth the undaunted youth, no flame that the hands of your men are able to kindle could destroy the love that glows in my heart. The praise of his beloved lingered on his lips until the last moment of his life. Among the women who distinguished themselves by the tenacity of their faith was one named Um i Ashraf, the mother of Ashraf, who was newly married when the storm of Zanjan broke out. She was within the fort when she gave birth to her son, Ashraf. Both mother and child survived the massacre that marked the closing stages of that tragedy. Years afterwards, when her son had grown into a youth of great promise, he was involved in the persecutions that afflicted his brethren. Unable to persuade him to recant, his enemies endeavoured to alarm his mother and convince her of the necessity of saving him ere it was too late from his fate. I will disown you as my son, cried the mother, when brought face to face with him, if you incline your heart to such evil whisperings and allow them to turn you away from the truth. Faithful to his mother's admonitions, Ashraf met his death with intrepid calm. Though herself a witness to the cruelties inflicted on her son, she made no lamentation, neither did she shed a tear. This marvellous mother showed a courage and fortitude that amazed the perpetrators of that shameless deed. I have now in mind, she exclaimed as she cast a parting glance at the corpse of her son, the vow I made on the day of your birth, while besieged in the fort of Ali Mardan Khan. I rejoice that you, the only son whom God gave me, have enabled me to redeem that pledge. My pen is powerless to portray, much less to render befitting tribute to, the consuming enthusiasm that glowed in those valiant hearts. Violent as were the winds of adversity, they were powerless to quench its flame. Men and women laboured with unabating fervour to strengthen the defences of the fort and reconstruct whatever the enemy had demolished. What leisure they could obtain was consecrated to prayer. Every thought, every desire was subordinated to the paramount necessity of guarding their stronghold against the onslaughts of the assailant. The part the women played in these operations was no less arduous than that accomplished by their men companions. Every woman, irrespective of rank and age, joined with energy in the common task. They sewed the garments, baked the bread, ministered to the sick and wounded, repaired the barricades, cleared away from the courts and terraces the balls and missiles fired upon them by the enemy, and last but not least, cheered the faint in heart and animated the faith of the wavering. Even the children joined in giving whatever assistance was in their power to the common cause, and seemed to be fired by an enthusiasm no less remarkable than that which their fathers and mothers displayed. Such was the spirit of solidarity that characterized their labors, and such the heroism of their acts, that the enemy was led to believe their number was no less than 10,000. It was generally conceded that a continual supply of provisions found its way in an unaccountable manner to the fort, and that fresh reinforcements were being steadily dispatched from Nairiz, from Khorasan, and from Tabriz. The power of the besieged seemed to them as unshakable as ever, their resources inexhaustible. The Amir Tuman 
exasperated by their unyielding tenacity and spurred by the rebukes and protestations of the authorities in Tehran, determined to resort to the abject weapons of treachery in order to exact the complete submission of the besieged. Firmly convinced of the futility of his efforts to face his opponents in the field honorably, he craftily called for the suspension of hostilities and gave currency to the report that the Shah had decided to abandon the whole enterprise. He represented this sovereign as having, from the very beginning, discountenanced the idea of extending his support to the forces that fought in Mazindaran and Nairiz, and of having deplored the shedding of so much blood for so insignificant a cause. The people of Zanjan and the surrounding villages were led to believe that Naziridin Shah had actually ordered the Amir Tuman to negotiate a friendly settlement of the issues between him and Hujat, and that it was his intention to put an end as speedily as possible to this unhappy state of affairs. Assured that the people had been deceived by his coming plot, he drew up an appeal for peace in which he assured Hujat of the sincerity of his intention of achieving a lasting settlement between him and his supporters. He accompanied that declaration with a sealed copy of the Koran as a testimony of the sacredness of his pledge. My sovereign, he added, has forgiven you. You, as well as your followers, I hereby solemnly declare to be under the protection of his imperial majesty. This book of God is my witness that if any of you decide to come out of the fort, you will be safe from any danger. Hujat reverently received the Koran from the hand of the messenger, and as soon as he had read the appeal, bade its bearer inform his master that he would send an answer in the course of the following day. At night he gathered his chief companions and spoke to them of the misgivings he entertained as to the sincerity of the enemy's declarations. The treacheries of Mazinderan and Nairiz are still vivid in our minds. That which was perpetrated against them, the same they purpose to perpetrate against us. In deference to the Koran, however, we shall respond to their invitation and shall dispatch to their camp a number of our companions, that thereby their deceitfulness may be exposed. I have heard Ustad Mir Ali i Haddad, who survived the massacre of Zanjan, relate the following. I was one of the nine children, none of whom were more than ten years old, who accompanied the delegation sent by Hushat to the Amir Tuman. The rest were men of over eighty years of age. Among them were Kabilai Maula Kuli Akadadash, Darvish Salah, Mohammed Rahim, and Muhammad. Darvish Salah was a most impressive figure, tall of stature, white-bearded, and of singular beauty. He was greatly esteemed for his honourable and just conduct. His intervention on behalf of the downtrodden invariably received the consideration and sympathy of the authorities concerned. He renounced, after his conversion, all the honours he had received, and though far advanced in age, enrolled himself among the defenders of the fort. He marched before us, carrying the sealed Quran, as we were led into the presence of the Amir Tuman. Reaching his tent, we stood at its entrance awaiting his orders. To our salute, he gave no response, and treated us with marked contempt. He kept us standing half an hour before he deigned to address us in a tone of severe reprimand. A meaner and more shameless people than you, he cried in haughty scorn, has never been seen. He had hurled his denunciations at us when one of the companions, the oldest and feeblest among them, begged to be allowed to say a few words to him, and, on obtaining his permission, spoke unlettered though he was, in a manner that could not fail to excite our profound admiration. God knows, he pleaded, that we were and will ever remain loyal and law-abiding subjects of our sovereign, and with no other desire than to advance the true interest of his government and people. We have been grievously misrepresented by our ill-wishers. No one of the Shah's representatives was inclined to protect or befriend us. No one was found to plead our cause before us. We repeatedly appealed to him, but he ignored our entreaty and was deaf to our call. Our enemies, emboldened by the indifference which characterized the attitude of the ruling authorities, assailed us from every side, plundered our property, violated the honor of our wives and daughters, and captured our children. Undefended by our government and encompassed by our foes, we felt constrained to arise and defend our lives. The Amir Tuman turned to his lieutenant and asked him what action he would advise him to take. I am at a loss, the Amir added, as to the answer I should give this man. Were I at heart religious, I would unhesitatingly embrace his cause. Nothing but the sword, replied his lieutenant, will deliver us from the abomination of heresy. 
I still hold the Koran in my hand, interposed Darvish Salah, and carry the declaration which you, of your own accord, chose to make. Are the words we have just heard our reward for having responded to your appeal? The Amir Tuman, in a burst of fury, ordered that Darvish Salah's beard be torn out, and that he, with those who were with him, be thrown into a dungeon. I and the rest of the children were scared and attempted to escape. Raising the cry of Ya Sahibu Saman, we hurried in the direction of our barricade. Some of us were overtaken and made prisoners. As I was fleeing, the man who was pursuing me laid hold upon the hem of my garment. I tore myself away from him and managed to reach the gate that led to the approaches of the fort in a state of utter exhaustion. How great was my surprise when I saw one of the companions, a man named Imam Kuli, being savagely mutilated by the enemy. I was horrified as I gazed upon that scene, knowing as I did that on that very day the cessation of hostilities had been proclaimed and the most solemn pledges given that no acts of violence would be committed. I was soon informed that the victim had been betrayed by his brother, who on the pretext of desiring to speak with him had handed him over to his persecutors. I straightway hastened to Hujat, who lovingly received me, and wiping the dust from my face and clothing me with new garments, invited me to be seated by his side and bade me to tell him the fate of his companions. I described to him all that I had seen. It is the tumult of the day of resurrection, he explained, a tumult such as the world has never seen before. This is the day on which man shall fly from his brother and his mother and his father and his wife and his children. Quote from the Quran, 80.34. This is the day when man, not content with having abandoned his brother, sacrifices his substance in order to shed the blood of his nearest kinsman. This is the day when every suckling woman shall forsake her suckling babe, and every woman that hath a burden in her womb shall cast her burden. And thou shalt see men drunken, yet are they not drunken, but it is the mighty chastisement of God. Quote from the Quran, 22.2. Seating himself in the centre of the Maidan, Hujat summoned his followers. On their arrival he arose, and standing erect in their midst, spoke to them these words, I am well pleased with your unflinching endeavours, my beloved companions. Our enemies are bent upon our destruction. They harbour no other desire. Their intention was to trick you into coming out of the fort, and then to slaughter you mercilessly out of their heart's desire. Finding that their treachery has been exposed, they have, in the fury of their rage, ill-treated and imprisoned the oldest and the youngest among you. It is clear that not until they capture this fort and scatter you will they lay down their arms and cease their persecutions against us. Your continued presence in this fort will eventually cause you to be taken captive by the enemy, who will of a certainty dishonor your wives and slay your children. Better is it, therefore, for you to make your escape in the middle of the night to take your wives and children with you. Let each one seek a place of safety until such time as this tyranny shall be overpassed. I shall remain alone to face the enemy. It were better that my death should allay their thirst for revenge than that you should all perish. The companions were moved to their very depths and with tears in their eyes declared their firm resolve to remain to the end by his side. We can never consent, they exclaimed, to abandon you to the mercy of a murderous enemy. Our lives are not more precious than your life, neither are our families of a more noble descent than that of your kinsmen. Whatever calamity may befall you, it is what we shall welcome for ourselves. All except a few remained true to their pledge, these unable to bear the ever-increasing distress of a prolonged siege, and encouraged by the advice of Hujat himself, had given them betook themselves to a place of safety outside the fort, thus separating themselves from the rest of their fellow disciples. Nerved to a resolve of despair, the Amir Tuman ordered all able-bodied men in Zanjan to assemble in the neighborhood of his camp, ready to receive his commands. He reorganized the forces of his regiments, appointed their officers, and added them to the host of fresh recruits that had massed in the town. He ordered no less than sixteen regiments, each equipped with ten guns, to march against the fort. Eight of these regiments were charged to attack the fort every forenoon, after which the remainder of the forces were to replace them in their offensive until the approach of evening. The Amir himself took the field and was seen in the forenoon of every day directing the efforts of his host 
assuring them of the reward awaiting their success, and warning them of the punishment which, in the event of defeat, the sovereign would inflict upon them. For one whole month the siege continued. Not content with attacks by day, the enemy several times attacked them by night also. The fierceness of their onslaughts, the overwhelming force of their numbers, and the rapid succession of the onsets thinned the ranks of the companions and aggravated their distress. Reinforcements for the enemy continued to pour in from all directions, while the besieged languished in a state of misery and hunger. The Amir Nizam, meanwhile, decided to strengthen the hands of the Amir Tuman by the appointment of Hassan Ali Khan i Karusi, who was commanded to march at the head of two Sunni regiments to Zanjan. His arrival was the signal for the concentration of the enemy's artillery on the fort. A tremendous bombardment threatened the structure with immediate destruction. It lasted for a number of days, during which the stronghold stood firm in spite of the increasing fire which was directed against it. The friends of Hujat displayed during those days a valour and skill that even their bitterest foes were compelled to admire. One day, while the bombardment was still in progress, a bullet struck Hujat in the right arm as he was performing his ablutions. Though he ordered his servant not to inform his wife of the wound he had received, yet such was the man's grief that he was powerless to conceal his emotion. His tears betrayed his distress, and no sooner had the wife of Hujat learned of the injury inflicted on her husband than she ran in distress and found him absorbed in prayer in a state of unruffled calm. Though bleeding profusely from his wound, his face retained its expression of undisturbed confidence. Pardon this people, O God, he was heard to say, for they know not what they do. Have mercy upon them, for they who have led them astray are alone responsible for the misdeeds the hands of this people have wrought. Hushat sought to calm the agitation of his wife and relatives at the sight of the blood that covered his body. Rejoice, he told them, for I am still with you and desire you to be wholly resigned to God's will. What you now behold is but a drop compared to the ocean of afflictions that will be poured forth at the hour of my death. Whatever be his decree, it is our duty to acquiesce and bow down to his will. No sooner had the news that he had been wounded reached the companions than they laid down their arms and hastened to him. The enemy, meanwhile, taking advantage of the momentary absence of their adversaries, redoubled their attack upon the fort and were able to force their passage through its gate. That day they took captive no less than a hundred of the women and children and plundered all their possessions. Despite the severity of that winter, these captives were left exposed in the open for no less than fifteen days and nights to a biting cold such as Zanjan had rarely experienced. Clad in the thinnest of garments, with no covering to protect them, they were abandoned without food and shelter in the wilderness. Their only protection was the gauze that covered their heads, with which they sought in vain to shield their faces from the icy wind that blew mercilessly upon them. Crowds of women, most of whom were inferior to them in social position, flocked from the various quarters of Zanjan to the scene of their sufferings, and poured upon them contempt and ridicule. You have now found your God, they scornfully exclaimed as they danced wildly around them, and have been rewarded abundantly by him. They spat in their faces and heaped upon them the foulest invectives. The capture of the fort, their robbing Hujat's companions of their chief instrument of defence, failed either to daunt their spirit or discourage their efforts. All property on which the enemy could lay its hands was plundered, and the women and children who were left defenceless were made captives. The rest of the companions, together with the remaining women and children, crowded into the houses that lay in the close vicinity of Hujat's residence. They were divided into five companies, each consisting of nineteen times nineteen companions. From each of these companies, nineteen would rush forth together and, raising with one voice the cry of Ya Sahibu Saman, would fling themselves into the midst of the enemy and would succeed in scattering its forces. The uplifted voices of these ninety-five companions would alone prove sufficient to paralyze the efforts and crush the spirit of their assailants. This state of affairs continued for a few days, bringing in its wake both humiliation and loss to an enemy that had believed itself capable of achieving immediate and signal victory. Many were killed in the course of these encounters. Officers, to the distress of their superiors, were beginning to desert their posts. 
The captains of the artillery were abandoning their guns, whilst the rank and file of the army was demoralized and completely exhausted. The Amir Tuman was himself weary of the coercive measures to which he had been compelled to resort in order to maintain the discipline of his men and to keep unimpaired their efficiency and vigor. He was driven again to take counsel with the remainder of his officers and to seek a desperate remedy for a situation that was fraught with great danger to his own life, no less than to that of the inhabitants of Zanjan. I am weary, he confessed, of the grim resistance of this people. They are evidently animated by a spirit which no amount of encouragement from our sovereign can hope to call forth in our own men. Such self-renunciation surely no one in the ranks of our army is able to manifest. No power that I can command is able to arouse my men from the slough of despair into which they have fallen. Whether they triumph or fail, these soldiers believe themselves doomed to eternal damnation. Their mature deliberations resulted in the decision to dig out underground passages from their site, which their camp occupied, to a place underneath the quarter in which the dwellings of Hujat's adherents were situated. They determined to blow up these houses, and by this means to force them to an unconditional surrender. For one whole month they laboured to fill these underground passages with all manner of explosives, and continued at the same time to demolish with fiendish cruelty such houses as remained standing. Wishing to accelerate the work of destruction, the Amir Tuman ordered the officers in charge of his artillery to direct their fire upon Hujat's residence, as the buildings that intervened between that house and the camp of the enemy had been raised to the ground, there remaining no further obstacle in the way of its ultimate destruction. A section of his dwelling had already collapsed when Hujat, who was still living within its walls, turned to his wife Khadiji, who was holding Hadi, their baby, in their arms, and warned her that the day was fast approaching when she and her infant might be taken captive, and bade her be prepared for that day. She was giving vent to her distress when a cannonball struck the room which she occupied and killed her instantly. A child, whom she was holding to her breast, fell into the brazier beside her and shortly afterwards died of the injuries he had received in the house of Mirza Abul Qasim, the Mushtahid of Zanjan. Hujat, though filled with grief, refused to yield to idle sorrow. The day whereon I found thy beloved one, O oh my God, he cried, and recognized in him the manifestation of thy eternal spirit, I foresaw the woes that I should suffer for thee. Great as have been until now my sorrows, they can never compare with the agonies that I would willingly suffer in thy name. How can this miserable life of mine, the loss of my wife and of my child, and the sacrifice of the band of my kindred and companions, compare with the blessings which the recognition of thy manifestation has bestowed on me? Would that a myriad lives were mine, would that I possessed the riches of the whole earth and its glory, that I might resign them all freely and joyously in thy power. The tragic loss their beloved leader had sustained, and the grievous wound inflicted upon him, distressed the companions of Hujat, and filled them with burning indignation. They determined to make a last and desperate effort to avenge the blood of their slaughtered brethren. Hujat, however, dissuaded them from making that attempt, and exhausted them not to hasten the issue of the conflict. He bade them resign themselves to the will of God, and to remain calm and steadfast to the end, whenever that end might come. As time went on, their number diminished, their sufferings multiplied, and the area within which they could feel secure was reduced. On the morning of the fifth of the month of Rabbi ul Aval in the year eight eight twelve sixty seven, the eighth of January eighty eighteen fifty one, Hujat, who had already for nineteen days endured the severe pain caused by his wound, was in the act of prayer and had fallen prostrate upon his face, invoking the name of the Bab, when suddenly he passed away. His sudden death came as a severe shock to his kindred and companions. Their grief at the passing of so able, so accomplished, and so inspiring a leader was profound. The loss was irreparable. Two of his companions, Tin Muhammad Vazir and Mir Rizai i Sardar, straightway undertook, ere the enemy was made aware of his death, to inter his remains in a place which neither his kindred nor his friends could suspect. 
At midnight, the body was borne to a room that belonged to Din Mohammed Vazir, where it received burial. They demolished that room in order to ensure the safety of the remains from destruction and exercise the utmost care to maintain the secrecy of that spot. More than 500 women who survived that terrible tragedy were immediately after the death of Fushat gathered together in his house. His companions, in spite of the death of their leader, continued to face with undiminished zeal the forces of their assailants. Of the great multitude that had flocked to the standard of Fujat, there remained only 200 vigorous men. The rest either had died or were utterly incapacitated by the wounds they had received. The knowledge of the removal of so inspiring a leader nerved the enemy to resistance and decided them to wipe out what still remained of the formidable forces they had been unable to subdue. They launched a general attack fiercer and more determined than any previous one. Animated by the beating of drums and the sounding of trumpets and encouraged by the shouts of exultation raised by the populace, they threw themselves upon the companions with unbridled ferocity resolved not to rest until the whole company had been annihilated. In the face of this fierce onset, the companions raised once more the cry of Ya Sahibu Saman and rushed forth undismayed to continue the heroic struggle until all of them had been either slain or captured. That massacre had scarcely been perpetrated when the signal was given for a pillage unexampled in its scope and ferocity. Had not the Amir Tuman issued orders to spare what remained of the house and belongings of Hushat, and to refrain from any acts of violence against his kindred, even more dastardly attacks would have been made by his rapacious army. His intention was to inform the authorities in Tehran and to seek from them whatever advice they wished to give him. He failed, however, to restrain indefinitely the spirit of violence which animated his men. The ulamas of Zanjan, flushed with the victory that had cost them such exertion and loss of life, and which had involved to such an unprecedented degree their reputation and prestige, endeavoured to incite the populace to commit every imaginable outrage against the lives of their men captives and the honour of their women. The sentinels who guarded the entrance to the house in which Hujat had been living were driven from their posts in the general tumult that ensued. The populace joined hands with the army to plunder the property and assail the persons of the few who still survived that memorable struggle. Neither the Amir Tuman nor the governor was able to allay the thirst for plunder and revenge which had seized the whole town. Order and discipline no longer existed in the midst of the general confusion. The governor of the province was, however, able to induce the officers of the army to gather together the captives into the house of a certain Haji Ghulam, and to keep them in custody until the arrival of fresh instructions from Tehran. The entire company were huddled together like sheep in that wretched place, exposed to the cold of a severe winter. The enclosure into which they were crowded was roofless and without furniture. For a few days they remained without food. From thence the women were removed to the house of a mushtahid named Mirza Abul Qasim in the hope that he would induce them to recant, in return for which they would be offered their freedom. The greedy mushtahid, however, had, with the aid of his wives, his sisters and daughters, succeeded in seizing all they had been allowed to carry with them, had stripped them of their garments, clothed them with the meanest attire, and appropriated for himself whatever valuables he could find among their belongings. After suffering untold hardships, these women captives were allowed to join their relatives on condition that these would undertake full responsibility for their future behavior. The rest were dispersed throughout the neighboring villages, the inhabitants of which, unlike the people of Zanjan, welcomed the newcomers with treatment that was at once affectionate and genuine. The family of Hujat, however, were detained in Zanjan until the arrival of definite instructions from Tehran. As to the wounded, they were placed in custody until such time as the authorities in the capital should send directions as how they were to be treated. Meanwhile, the severity of the cold to which they were exposed and the cruelties they underwent were such that within a few days they had all perished. The rest of the captives were delivered by the Amir Tuman into the hands of the Karusi, the Kamsi, and the Iraqi regiments, with orders that they be immediately executed. They were conducted in procession to the accompaniment of drums and trumpets to the camp where the army was stationed. 
All these regiments combine to add to the horror of the abominations perpetrated against the poor sufferers. Armed with their lances and spears, they flung themselves upon the seventy-six companions who still remained, piercing and mutilating their bodies with a savage ruthlessness that excelled the dark deeds of even the most refined torture-mongers of their race. The spirit of revenge which that day dominated those barbarous men passed all bounds. Regiment vied with regiment in committing the foulest atrocities which their ingenious minds could devise. They were preparing to swoop afresh upon their victims when a certain Haji Muhammad Hussein, father of Abba Basir, sprang to his feet and, raising the call of the Ajan, thrilled the multitude that had gathered about him. Though in the hour of his death, such were the fervor and majesty with which he pealed out the words, Allahu Akbar, the entire Iraqi regiment immediately proclaimed their refusal to continue participating in such shameful deeds. Deserting their posts and raising the cry of Ya Ali, they fled from that place of horror and disgust. Accursed be the Amir Tuman, they were heard to exclaim as they turned their backs on that scene of bloodshed and horror. That wretch has deceived us. With devilish persistence he sought to convince us of this people's disloyalty to the Imam Ali and to his kindred. Never, though we all be slain, will we consent to assist in such criminal deeds. A number of these captives were blown from guns. Others were stripped naked. Ice-cold water was poured upon their bodies, and they were lashed severely. Still others were smeared with treacle and left to perish in the snow. Despite the shame and cruelties they were made to suffer, not one of these captives was known either to recant or to utter one angry word against his persecutors. Not even a whisper of discontent escaped their lips, nor did their countenances betray a shadow of regret or grief. No amount of adversity could succeed in darkening the light that shone in those faces. No words, however insulting, could disturb the serenity of their expressions. No sooner had the persecutors finished their work than they began to seek for the body of Hujat, the place of whose burial the companions had carefully concealed. Most inhuman tortures had proved powerless to induce them to disclose the identity of that spot. The governor, exasperated by the failure of his search, asked that the seven-year-old son of Hujat, whose name was Hussein, be brought to him that he might attempt to induce him to disclose the secret. My son, he said, as he gently caressed him, I am filled with grief at the knowledge of all the afflictions that have been the lot of your parents. Not I, but the Mushtahits of Zanjan should be held responsible for the abominations that have been committed. I am now willing to accord the remains of your father a befitting burial, and wish to atone for the shameful deeds that have been perpetrated against him. By his gentle insinuations he succeeded in getting the child to reveal the secret, and thereupon he sent his men to fetch the body. No sooner had the object of his desire been delivered into his hands, and he ordered that it be dragged with a rope to the sound of drums and trumpets through the streets of Zanjan. For three days and three nights unspeakable injuries were heaped upon the body, which lay exposed to the eyes of the people in the Maidan. On the third night it was reported that a number of horsemen had succeeded in carrying away the remnants of the corpse to a place of safety in the direction of Qazvin. As to Hujat's kinsmen, orders were received from Tehran to conduct them to Shiraz and to deliver them into the hands of the governor. There they languished in poverty and misery. Whatever possessions still remained to them, the governor seized for himself and condemned the victims of his rapacity to seek shelter in a ruined and dilapidated house. Hujat's youngest son, Mihdi, died of the privations he and his family were made to suffer, and was buried in the very midst of the ruins that had served as his shelter. I was privileged, nine years after the termination of that memorable struggle, to visit Zanjan and witness the scene of those terrible butcheries. I beheld with grief and horror the ruins of the fort of Ali Mardan Khan, and trod the ground that had been saturated with the blood of its immortal defenders. I could discern on its gates and walls traces of the carnage that marked its surrender to the enemy, and could discover upon the very stones that had served as barricades stains of the blood that had been so profusely shed in that neighborhood. 
As to the number of those who fell in the course of these encounters, no accurate estimate has as yet been made. So numerous were those who participated in that struggle, and so prolonged the siege which they withstood, that to ascertain their names and number would be a task that I would hesitate to undertake. A tentative list of such names, which readers might do well to consult, has been prepared by Ismullahul Mim and Ismullahul Assad. Many and conflicting are the reports as to the exact number of those who struggled and fell under the banner of Hujat in Zanjan. Some have estimated that there were as many as a thousand martyrs. According to others, they were more numerous. I have heard it stated that one of the companions of Hujat, who undertook to record the names of those who had suffered martyrdom, had left a written statement in which he had computed the number of those who had fallen prior to the death of Hujat to be a thousand five hundred and ninety-eight, whilst those who had suffered martyrdom afterwards were thought to have been in all two hundred and two persons. For the accounts I have related of the happenings of Zanjan, I am primarily indebted to Mirza Muhammad Ali i Tabib i Zanjani, to Abba Basir, and to Sid Ashraf, all martyrs of the faith, with each of whom I was closely acquainted. The rest of my narrative is based upon the manuscript which a certain Mullah Hussein i Zanjani wrote and sent to the presence of Baha'u'llah, in which he recorded all the information he could glean from different sources regarding the events connected with that episode. What I have related of the struggle of Mazindaran has been similarly inspired, to a great extent, by the written account sent to the Holy Land by a certain Seed Abu Salib i Shamirzadi, as well as by the brief survey prepared here by one of the believers named Mirza Haydar Ali i Ardistani. I have, moreover, ascertained certain facts connected with that struggle from persons who actually participated in it, such as Mullah Muhammad Sadiq i Muqaddas, Mullah Mirza Muhammad i Furuqi, and Haji Abdul Majid, father of Badi and martyr to the faith. As to the events relating to the life and deeds of Wahid, I have obtained my information regarding what took place in Yazd from Rizar Ruh, who was one of his intimate companions. As to the later stages of that struggle in Nairiz, my narrative is mainly drawn from such information as I could gather from the detailed accounts sent to the Holy Land by a believer of that town named Mullah Shafi, who had carefully investigated the matter and had reported it to Baha'u'llah. Whatever my pen has failed to record, future generations will, I hope, gather together and preserve for posterity. Many, I confess, are the gaps in this narrative for which I beg the indulgence of my readers. It is my earnest hope that these gaps may be filled by those who will, after me, arise to compile an exhaustive and befitting account of these stirring events, the significance of which we can as yet but dimly discern. <laughs>